Good morning, everyone. We will go ahead and get started. Um, I'd like to start off today by uh, wishing Secretary Bookbar a very happy birthday. I'm sure you will all join me in that. Um, and we'll go ahead and let the birthday girl start things off. <laughs> Thanks. Wanda promised me a mimosa this morning, but it's nowhere to be seen. So, you know, I'm very disappointed. Thanks everybody for joining us. Um, as usual, I will start with the latest numbers and then we can talk about uh, the issues in the news this week. And then of course, I'm happy to take questions. So total voter registration to date is 9,071,343, uh, roughly the same percentages broken down by party as two days ago. Uh, if the comms team can put that in the chat, that would be great. Um, the final registration numbers are expected next week. Uh, approved mail-in and absentee applications statewide uh, continuously jumping significantly. So we've had 2,940,219 approved absentee and mail-in applications. Of those over 2.9 million, uh, 1,864,361 are Democratic, 739,511 are Republican, and 336,347 are other. Uh, of those, the ballots that are already confirmed for mailing are just under 2.9 million. And we again saw a huge jump in the ballots uh, returned and, uh, and uh, up uploaded by the, the county. So almost 1.5 million Pennsylvanians have already cast their ballots. And that's just incredible. So it's 1,449,000. 400. So it's it's almost exactly the total number of Pennsylvanians who voted by mail in the primary, we, and we still have 11 days to go. So that is approximately 50% of the ballots that have been mailed have now already been cast. Um, and if you recall, two days ago, we were at 41%. So already jumped to 50% in two days. Um, of those uh, Democratic uh, voters are 1,023,402, and Republican are 293,318, and other are 132,680. So with 11 days still to go, 70% of counties have already received more than 50% of their mail ballots back. And for context, at this point before the primary, less than 30% had been cast statewide. So it's really, it's very, very much far ahead, farther ahead than it had been before the primary. And for further historic context, because these numbers, you know, really when you hear them uh, in context of history, it's just such an incredible change. So in 2016, there were 266,208 absentee ballots cast statewide. In 2012, it was 248,561. And again, 11 days before the election, we already have almost 1.5 million ballots cast by mail. Um, so of those early, of those mail-in ballots uh, cast already, uh, approximately 66,484 have been cast through what we call over-the-counter transactions or in-person early voting, like I did a few weeks ago. Okay, so a couple of issues uh, in the news. Um, I want to assure every Pennsylvanian that whether the whether any attempted interference it, in our electoral process comes from overseas, whether it's Russia or Iran or anywhere else, or domestic like the Proud Boys, I want you all to know that Pennsylvania is prepared and protected. Since, since 2016, we have greatly intensified our election security efforts we fortified our voting system defenses, we've established a layered set of protections that are in place 24 seven, and we work very closely with local, state, and federal law enforcement and security partners to continuously monitor and protect our security. And of course, on top of that, in the last two years, all 67 counties have installed new voting systems that meet the latest standards of security, auditability, and accessibility, and have voter verifiable auditable paper ballots. So Pennsylvania voters can feel confident in the integrity and security of their election. 
And I want to emphasize, if voters receive any emails like those, we, we still don't have any reports of Pennsylvania, specific reports of Pennsylvanians receiving the emails that were uh, in the press. However, I want to emphasize that if voters at any point receive any emails like this, robocalls, anything, you should please alert your county election office and your local district attorney. And you can also call us directly at Department of State at our toll-free number 877-VOTES-PA. And whether it's those emails or robocalls or whether it's other forms of voter intimidation, um, I want to remind everybody that voter intimidation is illegal under state and federal law and carries significant penalties. We will not tolerate it in Pennsylvania. Any voter who feels that they are being intimidated for any reason um, should alert, again, their county election office, their local district attorney, and call 877-VOTES-PA to let us know as well. We will work with local, state, and federal law enforcement to investigate and protect as needed and, and prosecute um, any offenses that we identify. Okay, some of you asked about um, reports of some duplicate mail ballots uh, that went out. Uh, approximately 4,287 voters across the state in the last couple of weeks may have received some duplicate ballots due to an issue that was caused when ballots were printed using this specific method called the direct print method. An IT solution was deployed last week that fixed the underlying problem, which we were aware of in a different scenario, but these ballots had apparently been sent before that solution was implemented. So we're continuing to investigate and monitor to make sure there's not other factors contributing to this issue or any other, and also to prevent future duplicates ballots from going out. It's important to remember that all duplicate ballots are coded for that same voter. So if you get two, they're both coded to you. And our system has a hard stop that prevents a second ballot from being counted. So even if a person tried to cast two ballots, which of course violates, is a felony in Pennsylvania, um, it could not be counted because of this hard stop that fully prevents a second ballot from being counted for that voter. We are going to contact affected voters via email and phone calls, and we're going to tell them if, if any voter does receive a duplicate ballot, they should destroy one of them, or they can void it, bring it to the county election office, and they should cast the other ballot, of course, as soon as possible. On a lighter note, uh, we've also received several media inquiries about whether selfies are permitted in the voting booth. Um, Although the framers of the Constitution, um, I think, were not carrying around their cell phones when they voted, uh, recent court cases have, have found a First Amendment right to take photos of yourself while voting. So remember to smile when you're casting your ballot. And OK, uh, we're now five days from the deadline of October 27th to apply for your mail ballot. Do not wait please do it today. Go to votespa.com if you're planning to vote by mail. You can go in person to your county election offices. Do not wait. You don't want to wait till a week before the election to apply for your mail ballot if that's how you plan to vote. Um, and, once, and if you've already applied, once you get your ballot, do not wait in casting that ballot. I'm urging every Pennsylvanian who plans to vote by mail to complete and return their ballot this weekend so that they can feel confident that their ballot will be received in time. We've actually been mailing postcards to voters who've requested ballots uh, to urge them to cast those ballots as soon as humanly possible. Um, those uh, postcards have been hitting this week, they'll continue to hit next week, and they're urging voters to cast those ballots as soon as possible, if possible, in person. Um, as I mentioned on Wednesday, uh, litigation comes and goes, and so it has this week. And again, I want to urge voters that you don't actually have to track the litigation at all. Just cast your ballot by Tuesday, November 3rd. Deliver it in person if at all possible. There's so many options this year. You could go to votespa.com, click on your county election office, and it will tell you the list of county election offices, satellite election offices, designated drop boxes, or other authorized secure locations. There's so many choices for dropping them off in person that I highly encourage everybody to do so at this point. If you're out of the area and you have to mail, 
I really can't urge you strongly enough. Do so now. Put it in the mail now. Do so no later than Monday, October 26th, if at all possible. And I also want to remind people, in Pennsylvania, we can only deliver our own ballot. So you don't volunteer to drop off your ballot, the ballot for your spouse or your sister or your mother. We can only deliver our own ballots, except for voters with disabilities who can designate an agent. And you can go to votespa.com. We have an agency form and the person who's designating the agent fills it out. The agent signs it, accepting responsibility for delivering that ballot. And then you just include that with your ballot. But that's the only circumstance in Pennsylvania where somebody else can deliver your ballot for you. And of course, please don't return a naked ballot because it won't count. Make sure you're gonna get two, two envelopes. Make sure that you first put the ballot in the white inner secrecy envelope and then put that white inner secrecy envelope in the pre-printed outer return envelope. Complete and sign the voter's declaration on the outer envelope and make sure that you double check that you've done all these steps so that your ballot will count. And again, please don't wait until a deadline, do it today. Uh, I will remind everybody you still have a couple more days to vote in person so early. So the in-person early voting option, if you wanna do the all-in-one where you're applying for it and casting your ballot all in one visit, that you have to do by October 27th, so next Tuesday. So over the next couple of days, and a lot of counties have, uh, you know, county election offices for, for this option open over the weekend or evenings or various hours, you can go to votespa.com to check those hours. Again, if you're doing it all in one, you have to do it by Tuesday, October 27th. You can apply for your mail ballot before then, uh, before October 27th, and then cast your ballot in person before on or before November 3rd. So that's a perfectly good option if you can't get to your county election office in person um, by October 27th. Um, also, just make sure that you call ahead to your county election office before you show up to make sure what hours they're open. And a lot of counties are also having, have the opportunity to make an appointment online so that those voters, you know, can actually go at that time and not have to wait in line. And of course, we will still have voting in person on election day. Polls are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. We urge all voters to wear a mask, practice social distancing for your own safety and the safety of others. We're providing counties with masks, hand sanitizers, gloves, tape for marking social distance, hand sanitizer, disinfectant spray, and all kinds of other stuff to make sure that voters and election workers are safe and secure on election day. And now I'm happy to take your questions. Is somebody, is Wanda on mute or Ellen? Wanda, are you there? Oh, hosting duties got switched to me. <laughs> huh. Okay, how do I do this? Um, let's see. Anybody? Um, hmm. Seems that there was a change. I am trying to figure this out. Oh, Wanda, are you back? Hello, is Hi. everyone still with us? Yeah, are you there? You're back. <laughs> yes, sorry, I, I thought it was, Secretary, I thought it was your web that had frozen, but apparently it was mine. So um, sorry for the interruption there, everyone. Go ahead. Are, are you ready for questions now? Yes, thank you. <laughs> All right, we're going to start with, um, as soon as I can find her, uh, Colleen Knudsen from uh, WTAJ. 
And there she is. Go ahead, Colleen. Hi, good morning, Secretary. Happy birthday, happy Friday. Thank you. Um, I just had a quick question about uh, polling place changes. There's been some consolidating, especially in central PA, of polling places by actual request of you know schools, nursing homes, and churches where they're frequently held and had. Um, what are some things that your office is doing in order to get the word out other than just posting a sheet of paper on the door? Because there's concerns, especially with some older voters being told to go to one place, getting there the day of and not having a way to get to the next spot if they're in the incorrect spot. Thank you. Thank you. So um, any voter can go to votespa.com to their polling place locator. So I just want to, it's a, a great, actually, thank you for the uh, cue to remind voters that um, you could plug in your information uh, also, and it will tell you where your register, where your polling place is, but you could look for your polling place locator in case that's been changed. Um, and then the counties use different tools for notifying uh, voters of any changes in polling places. So the widespread consolidations that we saw in the primary are not happening in the general, so they'll be close to normal numbers of polling places. But as you mentioned, they may not be the places that people are used to voting because if they're senior facilities or their healthcare facilities, they may not be safe due to COVID-19. Uh, Deputy Secretary Marks, I see that you're on. I don't know if you want to give some ideas about some of the different ways that counties have been notifying um, uh, and I don't know which which county, Colleen, you're specifically talking about, but Jonathan, I don't know if you want to give an overview of what some of the counties are doing in terms of mailing or notifying their voters. Sure. When um, a lot of counties will uh, will print, you know, if if a precinct moves polling places, they'll print uh, new voter registration cards, send them out because uh, the voter registration card has the location of the polling place. Uh, the overwhelming majority of counties, from what I've seen, if not all of them, publish a list on their website uh, right around 20 days um, before an election, uh, listing the polling places. Um, as you mentioned, Secretary, the um, we have our polling place locator tool. Uh, the counties are still updating the information in the SHORE database, uh, which is what feeds that uh, tool on our website. Um, I believe the reporter actually mentioned posting at the old polling place. That's kind of the old fashioned um, way, but it's still a statutory requirement. Uh, they also, a lot of counties included in their uh, pre-election, there's the notice of November election that is also required by the election code. Uh, and that is published in newspapers of general circulation in the county. Uh, and, and that will often include a list of polling places as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will go to uh, Jan Murphy now from Penn Live. Um, just a reminder to everyone, if you have uh, indicated you'd like to ask a question, but your screen name does not let me know who you are, then um, that, that will not, probably will not get a question in. So um, there is an a, a ability to change your screen name. Uh, during the course of this meeting. And if you want to do that, I'll be looking for your name. Thank you. Go ahead, Jan. Hi, uh, Secretary, and happy birthday to you. Thanks, Jan. Um, I wanted to ask you, it seems like every year on election night when you're giving the wrap-up of how things went that day, we often hear about ballots and issues with ballots. So I was wondering how confident you are that counties have done all they can avoid to uh, avoid those issues that come up with the wrong size paper being used to light a print, printing errors on the ballots, not having enough ballots on hand. Now that counties have one um, election under their belt with these new voting systems, at least one, do you, do you expect this will be an issue this time? I, you know, I think you said it exactly right, Jan, that um, they all now have at least one uh, election under their belt. Um, so they've they've seen those those issues and particularly things like markers and I don't know that we saw any m marker issues in the primary but certainly we had seen those in the November general the year before um, you know I think they're all very much aware now of what markers are critical but you know to be used whether it's whatever blue pen black pen or some other marker for write-ins um, 
that kind of thing. I think, you know, they all clearly have now. In terms of the size of the paper that the vendors have cut, you know, again, I think, um, and those were all, I think, I think all of them, the, the size of the paper were all traceable to one vendor. Jonathan, is that right? Um, so we've yes, had- Yes, that's my recollection as well. Um, okay. it, was, it was a particular vendor. Um, you know, I was, I was going to add, you know, counties that also are um, during their pre-election logic and accuracy testing, you know, we've done a lot of work over the last couple of years to tighten that process up and make sure that when counties do that, they're actually using, um, you know, election day ballots that have been printed so that they're testing with, you know, ballots that are going to be used on election day as opposed to pristine ballots that are just for testing purposes. But uh, yeah, that the the size issue has really been traced back to one vendor. Um, so I, I wouldn't expect to see that in, in the upcoming November election. And that so that and the Jan, just to, fo to follow up on Jonathan's point about the logic and accuracy testing, it seems like each each election, um, our logic and accuracy testing follow up has you know, had some sort of clearer targets. And obviously this is one of them. So I think the counties are well aware of some of these things that they've seen in the last two elections on the new, with the new paper-based voting systems that didn't apply with the, uh, you know, electronic uh, uh, machines. So, um, but we, we will continue to be working with the counties to make sure that they follow all those checklist steps for that logic and accuracy testing. Secretary. Um, now we have uh, Kelly Manor from CNN, and next up will be Lucy Perkins, WESA. Go ahead, Kelly. Thank you, Rhonda, and happy birthday, Secretary. Um, my question is in regards to reports that the Trump campaign has been videotaping voters um, at drop boxes. I wanted to know what your response was to that. I know AG Shapiro had his own response. Um, is that a concern for you? Are you going to put up, uh, put out new guidance to counties in regards to how they should handle these situations going forward? So it is a concern, and um, you know we we have been in touch with law enforcement um, on this issue because it is, it, and it's actually already in our guidance that pe you know poll, poll, what there you know people cannot be. Uh, voter intimidation is illegal under state and federal law, and videotaping you, taking pictures of you, in, is in, without your consent, is part of that. Um, so, you know, I, you know, again, I, I defer to law enforcement on actual prosecution of such things. We have already put out that guidance, um, and do intend to follow up to make sure that the counties know. But the counties know, um, you know, and I think now it's a matter for. Uh, law enforcement to decide what's actually able to be prosecuted uh, as well. So we'll continue working with the counties and law enforcement on these issues. Okay, we have Lucy Perkins from WESA and next up will be Jonathan Lai Inquirer. Go ahead, Lucy. Thanks, Wanda. Uh, good morning, Secretary. I was wondering, um, we've been getting some questions from our listeners where, you know, a family of four voters all request their mail-in ballots and fills them out and mails them back on the same day. Um, but only, you know, two out of the four are, are getting updates through the system saying that their ballots have been received and then the other two say still pending. Why would, do, do you have any sense of why ballots that are mailed on the same day from the same location would have different results in the, in the system or different statuses in the system? Thank you. Sure. I mean, I think so. Some of it, some of it may be that the that what's reflected in the system, and, and we've talked about this, I think, in past weeks. What's reflected in the system, some of those earlier days, in particular, um, like that that those may not actually have reflected mailing dates. So it, there was an error made in like the first batch run for a couple of counties where that date mailed uh, field was triggered when it shouldn't have been. So, you know, we've, and we've discussed that already. I, you know, I think now that we're so close to election day, some of those dates are much more accurate um, because of the continuous processing of the ballots by the counties. But, um, and sometimes the counties have different ways for how they send out their ballots. So even if let's say you have people who applied on the same day, 
if one of them applied as an absentee ballot, one of them applied as a mail-in ballot, um, you know, one of them is a permanent voter or not, um, they may group, the county may group them and send them out in different groups rather than, they're not necessarily sending them out by household. So, and then of course, you know, I can't answer the, the postal service, you know, they, how, how they do things in particular, but um, those have been some of the explanations for why people don't necessarily get them same as there are other household members. Jonathan, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that. Yeah, and I think I think um, I wasn't sure if if she was talking about ballots that were returned to the county or ballots that were sent out. Um, ballots that returned, though, the the uh, reasons would be very similar. If um, you, you know, depending on whether it's an absentee or mail-in ballot, how the counties group them when they do their intake. Uh, and and scan them in. Um, you know, typically they would group them by precinct, uh, but they also may group them by type. Uh, so it it may very much matter exactly how the voter casts their ballot. If if you're referring to uh, ballots that are returned to the to the county. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We're going to go to uh, Jonathan Lai from the Inquirer, and uh, then after that will be Nick Corasaniti from the New York Times. Go ahead, Jonathan. Good morning, and Good morning. like everyone else, I'm going to say happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, on the legislative negotiating for pre-canvassing, I realize that's not on you to do, um, but if there is some sort of last minute deal, you know, we don't know that there is one, but if something happens, I'm curious from an administration standpoint, an election administration standpoint, um, at what point is it too late, right? You know, we, we've heard from different counties about when they can and can't do this. You know, at this point, is there still time? And if not, and if there is, when is the actual drop dead deadline? It's a good question, Jonathan. You know, look, I mean, obviously we're already too late for 21 days. We're already too late for 14 days. Um, so, you know, some of it is a matter of what we're talking about. Are we talking about that they can start on Saturday instead of on, you know, Tuesday morning? You know, I, I think that the, what's going to happen is you're going to lose the ability, the closer it is, the closer you lose, the more you lose the ability for some counties who have already committed their teams to doing the myriad of other things they need to do in those days before. Whereas if it were passed this week, which it didn't happen, um, despite our best efforts to make sure that it did, including willingness to compromise on a number of issues, um, you know, they would be able to plan staffing ahead of time, figure out if they need multiple teams doing different things in those last couple of days. So, um, so I don't, you know, I think, so what you might find is if a deal doesn't get made where they don't come back to the table be, before four days before election day, and they, you know, have something that passes that's effective the next day, it's just going to be the counties are going to be less able to shift gears that quickly. So I don't think there's a drop dead date, except to the extent that it's before whatever date they say they can start pre canvassing, but it's actual ability for counties to accommodate th that period of time is obviously going to be reduced. I, you know, I think every county would do everything they possibly could to take advantage of any additional days they get, no matter when they happen. Um, so, but obviously this, this would have been a key week to get this done and we're very disappointed. Thank you, Secretary. We're going to go to Nick Corsoniti from the New York Times and next up will be Mike Buffer, Citizen's Voice. Go ahead, Nick. Great. Thanks, Wanda, and thank you, Secretary. Happy birthday. Thank you. Um, so, um, uh, two questions, although along the same lines. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about um, the poll watching operation that the Trump campaign has been promoting, both on social media and that he said publicly. Um, and so, I'm wondering, you know, if you have any concerns about, you know, anything you've heard in terms of potential issues that could come with this poll watching operation. And then, second is a little bit more of a uh, policy-based question, but you know, what kind of systems are in place to, I guess, watch the poll watchers, for lack of a better word, and um, you know, ways to report and make sure that that operation is also following uh, state guidelines? 
Yeah, thank you, Nick. Um, so the, you know, what I would say is this, it, it, every, every election, you know, particularly presidential elections, um, there, there's always a sense that there could be significant problems, right? And thank goodness we in Pennsylvania have, you know, in part, I think because of how we um, make sure that our poll watchers have to be from that county and other things, have limited the opportunity for sort of outside influencers of voter suppression and intimidation by poll watchers. Um, but there's always, there's always um, fear and um, concern that it might happen. It does feel, this year feels, um, it feels like this is even a greater fear, um, but we do have a lot of good things in place that help manage that. And so, you know, we, but on top of that, it, to sort of get to your second point, which impacts the answer to the first question, um, the, we have this interagency work group on election security and preparedness that's only been in existence the last two, two and a half years. And so we are working very closely with Pima, the Pennsylvania Emergency Management Agency, Pennsylvania State Police, National Guard, Department of Military Veterans Affairs, Pennsylvania, uh, the Office of Homeland Security, um, as well as, you know, the Office of Attorney General, the Office of Inspector General, federal partners, um, county partners, to make sure that we are more coordinated and have stronger communications than we've ever had. And that's, that's critical, right? So it's critical both to sort of track what people are hearing on the ground in the lead up to election day. And that's everything from, you know, intelligence to monitoring social media to having a sense of what community groups um, and I mean that broadly are planning. And then also being in constant communication, both to prevent incidents, but then also respond to them as necessary. And so we are, we're actually with these, this, these interagency partners that I just mentioned, we're starting daily calls as of Monday. Um, so, you know, a week and a half before, or a little over a week before election day. And this is on top of the preparations that we've already had. We're gonna be having calls with the counties, both the emergency management folks, the law enforcement folks, and the elections folks to have everybody know exactly who to contact, how to contact them, how to, mi how to minimize and reduce tensions, uh, because we all know that, that that can make things worse but also who to call when you need a response. So I, I don't think there's ever been this level of coordination and collaboration among these cross-sector agencies that we've had this year. And I have high confidence that that will make a huge difference across the Commonwealth, should we see any problems. Thank you, Secretary. We'll go to Mike Buffer now, and then uh, next up is St uh, Tim Stuhldreyer Stuhl from One United Lancaster. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I was gonna ask about pre-canvassing and that was pretty much addressed, so I don't really think you need to go on about that anymore. Thanks. Okay, we will go to Tim Stuhldreyer, and next up will be Asha Prehar from uh, ELS. Go ahead, Tim. Uh, and, and similarly, my, my questions have been, been addressed, so I will yield my time. Thank you. Okay, you're challenging my orchestrating skills here. Uh, <laughs> let's see if Asha is with us. And I don't believe so. Okay, can we go with uh, Aaron Martin from WPXI? Yes, thank you, Secretary, and uh, happy birthday as well. Uh, I did have a quick question uh, in regards to uh, the possibility of ballots being rejected for either signatures or naked ballots or what have you. How concerning is that given just the sheer number of mail-in ballots and given the uh, obvious uh, very small margin of victory for Trump back in 2016? You know, it's such an entirely different year because of Act 77 that, um, you know, trying to compare it to any historic uh, numbers is, you know, futile, futile because it's just, it's so different. But so you have the issue, obviously, like, that you identify of naked ballots or signatures. You also have the hugely increased volume. 
but then you also have the hugely increased public education that has never existed on this scale. And so Department of State alone has put out, you know, bilingual, you know, TV, radio, digital ads, print. We've sent two rounds of postcards. Um, we've done, uh, We've done emails, you know, I hope that we'll be doing some texts in the next week and a half. Um, so, and that's just us. And then if you, you know, if you go through social media, there's so many organizations, candidates, parties who are informing people about naked ballots, informing people about um, signing their outer envelope and so forth. And so, you know, so it's, it, I think that is incredibly helpful because we're going to where people are to make sure that they get that information, but there's also volume that we've never seen before. So look, I, I think there's so many people talking about these issues and I'd ask all of you to continue to reinforce those messages that no ballot should go naked um, and every you know outer envelope needs to be signed. Um, and you know I, I have confidence that those that those communications are going to help tremendously. Um, and, you know, I think we're going to be tracking it as we go. So, um, but yeah, anything you all can do to help keep reinforcing that. I think, you know, I think every press release uh, we send out says it over and over and over again. Please include that in your articles because the more voters we can touch, the fewer will make those errors. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, we're going to go to Annie McCormick from 6ABC, and after that, we will go back to Asha Prihar, who is in fact present, and I overlooked her name. Go ahead, Annie. Hi, Secretary. Happy birthday. Thank you. Um, I want to follow up. I have two questions about voter intimidation. We're here in Philadelphia at 6ABC, so um, the first one is a follow-up to Kelly from CNN's question um, in regards to videotaping people that are dropping off at the ballot boxes. One just, I'm hoping you can clarify this for us. Um, we deal with this a lot in the press, is that there's no expectation of privacy when somebody is on a public street, you know, really doing anything is something that we deal with a lot. When people say to us, oh, you can't videotape us without our permission. If it's on a public street in public view, we're allowed to, to video them. And in fact, we have with people casting their ballots at those ballot boxes. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, can you explain the difference um, and, and how that could be violating um, in regards to what happened with the Trump poll watching and, and City Hall? So I think, you know, some of this I'm going to have to leave to the lawyers because this gets into some technical legal questions. But I think, you know, the question is whether it, it rises to the level, A, of voter intimidation and B, you know, I mean, I don't know if there's audio being used. So there's, you know, the prohibitions on recording somebody without their permission. Um, so the details matter. Um, and, you know, but I think it's really more of a question for the lawyers who, you know, I, I know that there was a threatened lawsuit, uh, you know, again, you know, I sort of can no longer track what's already been filed and, you know, what's just, what's been threatened. But, um, you know, I think this is something that's likely to be uh, batted out among the lawyers. But again, anything that I think is intimidating, obstructing, um, where a voter is feeling like their protected right to vote is being obstructed or threatened in some way, um, that crosses the line. I like your background, Annie. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, we will go to uh, Asha Prihar now from PLS. Thank you, Wanda, um, and happy birthday, Secretary. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, I was just wondering, um, I'm from Lebanon County and I was reading a local outlet recently and um, I read that our um, elections director uh, sort of set off um, set this um, cutoff date at November 1st where he said like if we receive like any mail-in or absentee ballots that we receive by this um, day will be counted on like election day or like election night um, and so I know you've um, mentioned like multiple times before like it'll be a matter of days um, most likely 
Um, but I was wondering if you've heard from like any of the like counties um, about any sort of similar cutoffs um, or timelines and like what those are looking like, um, just in terms of like what they're sort of going to commit to counting on election night. Yeah, um, you know, I think it's going to vary a lot from county to county because a lot of times count counties, for example, when they print their poll books, they print their poll books on different dates and they have different vendors who give them cutoff dates. And so they may decide, you know, I'm going to count all the all the ballots received by the time I printed my poll book or the supplemental poll book, which which many counties do, or some counties are stamping their poll book after it's printed to update the ballots received after they printed their poll book. So the counties do this all in a different way. And so, you know, I'm sure that uh, you said it was Lancaster or Lebanon? Lebanon? I think you said Lebanon. Um, either way, you bo both counties have great election directors who are gonna be very thoughtful in assessing sort of what they know, what they, what they know is current. So in, in their ability to make sure that they can get those done by whatever date um, and then move on to the next round. Um, and that helps them with reconciliation as well. So there's a lot of different reasons why they might pick those, those dates, uh, you know, just to make sure that they're organized. You know, counties are sorting their ballots and they're, they're really doing a great job at tracking what they've completed, also tracking what remains so that we all, whether it's press and public and whoever else, you know, this is a key part of what election day in the days following is going to look like is not only looking at what's been counted, which has always been part of election night reporting, but really tracking what remains. So that's going to be a large part of what we at the Department of State are going to be continuously following up with the counties to make sure that we can present that information to you as well. So Jonathan, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add or if that basically covers it. No, I, you, you did a great job um, explaining it, and, and this is something we've worked with. Uh, this is something we talked to the counties about um, in, in our meeting with them back in June, uh, it, and it's really about making sure you're organized for that pre-canvas. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm fairly certain that what uh, that Michael in Lebanon is talking about is, is that group of ballots that they're going to get, because they're going to have to provide lists in advance of the pre-canvas of every you know, every voter's ballot uh, that will be pre-canvassed. So I think it's really about organizing and, and locking in that group that you're going to be able to pre-canvass efficiently, as opposed to just lumping everything together and then trying to do that organization at the last minute, um, you know, right before 7 a.m. on the day of the pre-canvass. So it, it really is about organizing everything so that the pre-canvass can go smoothly. You, you can get through... <clears throat> excuse me, the overwhelming majority of your ballots uh, efficiently during the pre-canvas, and then you can count the rest of them uh, beginning after 8 p.m. on election night. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go to uh, Brian Yenos from uh, Fox News, and then we will have time for one more from David Kaplan, WTAE. Go ahead, Brian. Thank you, Wanda, and uh, thanks, Secretary. Uh, my question to you is, I think you, <clears throat> you sort of just answered it a little bit, and uh, some people have asked, uh, asked a lot of the questions I wanted to ask, but I think specifically in election night, if you can give us as much detail as possible as to um, what it, what can we expect as these results come in as to how we can monitor it and what actual data are, am I going to be able to communicate to our viewers and to our, you know, our, our folks back at, at headquarters. And uh, and one clarification, are we supposed to, do you think we're going to know, we're going to have all the ballots, most, you know, most of the results counted by the end of Wednesday, or is it by Friday? I just wanted to get that date down. So um, we're still working through, uh, in the next couple of days, we're going to be finalizing sort of what our, uh, what it's going to look like in terms of the data reporting. So the election night return, the sort of standard election night return website that you guys have been uh, used looking at for years um, is going to look a little different in that it's going to break down um, ballots received by mail, ballots received in person, and or I should say votes, votes, votes cast for any particular candidate by mail, votes cast for that candidate by in person, and votes cast for that candidate by provisional ballot. Um, and but 
and what we're we're changing so the tracker that you know kind of always said about precincts x number of precincts out of y number of precincts reporting we realized in the primary that 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 was no longer reflecting this wide huge number of people that were voting by mail so we're changing that and then we're also going to be separately tracking what ballots remain so like right now we're already tracking that right so we can see you know 2.9 million pennsylvanians uh you know have or yeah just under 2.9 million ballots have been sent to voters right we have those numbers broken down by county and then we can see that almost 1.5 million pennsylvanians have cast those ballots broken down by county so that obviously continues up until the last ballot is cast and so as votes are counted for say for example the mail-in ballots we can still see what remains right so that information is all going to be tracked and provided to you but what it's going to look like we're still working through those final details so i expect that next week we'll be um organizing some kind of briefing uh at some point uh probably later next week um that we'll reach out to folks to make sure that they know exactly what's going to look like where they need to go because there may be a couple of different places places and we'll be issuing updates throughout the night and the next day as for when the final ballots are going to be counted and you know what i've basically been saying is and you know uh the question that was asked of me earlier um you know if counties may be counting like like was asked before about lebanon county counting on election night through x date so it's not going to look exactly the same from county to county but basically we expect the overwhelming majority of ballots to be counted within a couple of days so some counties may have it done by the wee hours in the morning wednesday morning if they don't have hundreds of thousands of mail ballots some counties who have hundreds of thousands of mail ballots it may be a couple of days so um so it's going to look a little different from place to place but you're going to be able to see through us what's been counted and what remains and because those counties the larger counties have all committed to doing it 24 7 canvassing those ballots there's not going to be like you know a 10 hour period where everybody goes home and goes to sleep it's going to be continuously updated and we will keep updating you as well so um so stay tuned for you know further details on what that will look like at some point next week thank you secretary um and now we'll go with uh david kaplan from wtae go ahead david hi secretary thank you for your time today um just to follow up on what brian just asked uh the the new york times is reporting that uh, uh intelligence officials have sort of assessed that russia may be uh, trying to sow disinformation about the results in the days after the election uh, to try and confuse people or make people think that there's fraud. Um, is that something that's on your radar? Are you concerned about that in the absence of the ability uh, to pre-canvas that we're gonna, there, there could be misinformation going out as counties are trying to uh, diligently count these mail-in ballots? Um, so that's my first question. And then really quickly uh, on one of the things you addressed earlier for the duplicate ballots, those people, we're still getting reports. Look, I think he got cut off. Oh, sorry, uh, just a, we, we're, we're seeing that there were different barcodes for those duplicate ballots. So even though the barcodes are different, does that mean that a voter, you know, it's still, assigned to that voter and that voter won't be able to vote twice. Thank I'll you. I'll answer your second second question first because it's shorter. So the, yeah, those barcodes are correspondence IDs. They are both attributed to that same voter. So the voter IDs, and we have spreadsheets of the affected voters. You could see on the spreadsheets, the voter IDs are the same, the ballot IDs are the same. The correspondence ID corresponds to that voter. So that voter, that barcode, whichever, and it doesn't matter which one they trash and which one they cast, either one works, it will go to them and them only, and only one ballot can be loaded for that voter. Um, so yes, I mean, obviously we're always concerned about any attempts, whether they're foreign or domestic, to undermine uh, confidence in the election, to spread disinformation, to mess with, you know, to try to infiltrate whatever websites defacement whatever um and we're always monitoring all those things the key you know we i we have enormous 
layers of security around our statewide systems. Um, the, we need to be, you know, part of what we're going to be doing over the next week and a half, and obviously throughout uh, beyond that, is the, the more closely in touch we can be with counties so that we can be sharing that information. And I think we've talked about this before. Um, in fact, I think we talked about it um, the other day. There's a dashboard. So we have a uh, Homeland Security. We actually participate in two Homeland Security dashboards on election day, one at the federal level, one at the state level. We were actually the first state in the country to create a state level one with Pima. And so we, it's a, it's a great secure way of sharing information. So if you like, for example, if a county is experiencing something, they can share it and it's being, you know, communicated with emergency preparedness folks, with IT security folks, with law enforcement, with election officials across the state. Same at the federal level. I mean, we did this in 2018, participating in both those uh, dashboards was incredibly helpful because for example, there was a situation in November of 2018 where one state, you know, somewhere in uh, elsewhere across the country was reporting that they could see that they were being, there were attempted attacks by say these 20 IP addresses. They shared it with us. We could not only, we could block them at the state level and then we shared the the um, information with all 67 counties and they were able to independently block. So that level of coordination and communication is critical in the lead up to on election day and following election day. And we're gonna be, you know, we're gonna be doing, it's gonna be a longer period of time where we're gonna need to be actively monitoring any attempts to um, to mess with our democracy, which we will fight every attempt to do so. Thank you, Secretary. Sorry, I'm having a little trouble with my own unmute button here. Um, and that's gonna wrap it up for today. And um, the Department of State team will be back here next Wednesday at 10.30. So watch for the advisory on Tuesday afternoon. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, everybody.